Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this morning's study. Uh, this midweek, and we've got a couple more studies this and tomorrow to try to complete Jephthah. At least that's the plan, but we'll see what happens. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? The dear Father in heaven, we're grateful for the time that we have this morning promises in your word where two or three are gathered together that you are there in their midst and we invite your presence to speak to us to bring conviction and power in our lives that we can represent you to those around us and lord we need uh, understanding we have a short time before this camp meeting it's five weeks and um, we know, Lord, that there's much that we still have to do to prepare in our notes and in our understanding. And we pray for your people. We ask, Lord, that you can use us um, in this movement to reach one another, to teach those around us. And, Lord, we pray for um, our church for those that are seeking for truth and that need to be warned, we ask, Lord, that you can, can help us as we do our part in this work of redemption. We ask, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to be here as we look at these things to correct us of any errors and um, to guide our feet. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So good morning again. And uh, we're getting good views on these videos, even if there's not as many people here every morning. People are watching them. And um, anybody who's watching these videos, if you have any comments, feel free to write those in uh, the chat under the video. I prefer that over people sending me emails. Um, you know, if they have questions or comments or observations, uh, it's always nice to have. Now, yesterday we complete, we started looking at a line completely different. And that was based upon the idea that the name of Jephthah, 3316 in the Hebrew, is the number of days halfway between, uh, September 11th and November 9th, with that center day being the 10th day of the 10th month on our calendar. That is, it's going to be also the 10th year, but it's going to be 10, 10, 10, so October 10th, 2010. Um, and that's significant as well because it's also the first day of the seventh month on the biblical calendar. So it's Rosh Hashanah, the new year, right? And um, 10, 10, 10 in a IP address is, uh, has to do with uh, uh, an internal network. Is that how it works around? Yeah. yeah I don't much understand those addresses, but... Uh, so it's 10.10.10, .10 and then you have some other numbers after that. So that's the prefix of an internal IP address. Now, um, so the 1010 is important, obviously. It's also the date of the siege in uh, 587 BC, the siege of Jerusalem. It's the date that is specifically marked by Ezekiel, or that God has Ezekiel mark, to note this day, even this self-same day, that uh, Jerusalem is being besieged. And this is what Ezekiel had been pre predicting. But Ezekiel can't, of course, see it because he's 500 miles away. And um, so, but God tells him of it. And we know that he's not going to hear like he's 
he's not going to hear of the destruction of Jerusalem with an eyewitness until a person arrives uh, six months later, or well, six months after Jerusalem's destroyed. So first you have the siege, and then a year and a half later, the siege occurs, the walls are broken down, and then a month later, the temple is destroyed. So the walls are going to be broken down on July 18th. And then the temple is going to be destroyed uh, a month later. And um, and then six months after that, an escapee, somebody who escaped the destruction of Jerusalem, is going to come and tell him of it. So um, I mean, I think that information is is sort of relevant when we look at that center date. But there's there's lots of information there. There's lots of directions we could go in the study. But the main point that we have here is that this information gave us a starting point for um, our line which we had been drawing. So originally, and we sort of still need to evaluate this. So if we go here, um, let's get my head here. <clears throat> so originally we had taken this line of Jephthah and um, and we had taken this. Uh, so one of the things we would say is that there's this 18 years of oppression. So I gotta just share the screen properly here. <clears throat> and uh, so we have this 18 years. It talks about this period of 18 years. Now, from November 9th, if you go back to September 11th, that's going to be. 18 years and two months. So 33, 16 days is 18 years and one month, or nine years and one month, pardon me. And if you double it, it's 18 years and two months. Now, it's also 3,316 3, days from March 7th, 2021 to April 5th, 2030. Um, so that's significant. Uh, we're going to begin examining the foundation. March 27th, 2021. <clears throat> and we might actually have this in this line, but here's the line that we drew up first. So this was drawn out a few months ago. And uh, uh, so when we drew up this line, we started June 22nd and there, there was a rationale there in that this was addressing this specific chronology, dealing with the understanding of Ezra 7-9 and, and the chronology that's introduced in 2014. And so there's a lot of logic to this line. But when we, we consider this 18 years and we understand the symbols there, that led us to say, well, and, and I think this was initially a Dwight's suggestion for this line, is that this should be November 9th. So what we did is we said this 18 years of darkness from 9-11 to November 9th with 10-10-10, as the center date, which is the verse in Judges 10.10, where there's this repentance, right? They're going to repent. And so this is the center of a kaizen. Because they repent, God isn't still going to, uh, he's still going to have them being oppressed uh, for a time, right? But it, they have to show this repentance. So there's going to be all these events in chapter 10. And so we have November 9th then as this waymark that's going to start this line of Jephthah. So Jephthah arrives at the end of these uh, uh, 18 years and two months. So that's, that's how we understood this. Now, in doing this, this line isn't that much different otherwise. We're still going to have January 11th, 2020, except we're going to move it from an empowerment to the formalization of a message. And March 31st, so I had March 27th there, but March 31st is actually the date that Jeff notes January 11th. That is, this is part of the Levitical chiasm. Now, the Levitical chiasm is going to point to uh, March 27th, 2021. But uh, we have here, uh, so uh, 
So we're going to put the end of the Levitical chiasm here. That is what is. Uh, and then Jeff is going to note this. So we're just going to put here first presentation regarding this Levitical chiasm. I can't get rid of that for some reason. Uh, this is the thing. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I hate when they have the lowercase uh, first. But anyway, that's nothing I can correct. I don't know how to correct it. Anyway, so we have um, that first presentation that Jeff does on the Levitical Chiasm. So that's going to be March 31st. Um, so roughly 80 days later, around there. <clears throat> And then we focused upon mitzvah, right? So now that is Judges 11.11. 11. And um, so there was ideas there about Judges 11.11. 11. That's why that's doing this way. So Judges 11.11, 11. then Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and captain over them. And Jephthah uttered all the words, all his words, before the Lord in Mitzvah. Now, it, I mean, it with Judges 11.11, 11, I mean, we, we have a symbol that shows up many, many times. It's, it's a chiasm, um, symbol for 22, right? Um, also, Daniel eleven eleven, 11. and uh, so part of what was being presented um, in that period of time when Jeff is presenting, he's dealing with uh, raffia. So on, on March 28th, he's actually going to present about uh, the 1,533 days that he, um, from when he presented raffia, to March 27th, 2021. It's going to be 1,533 days. So, so in this 11.11, we know that it relates to Daniel 11.11. 11. Uh, well, and he's going to represent Paneum specifically, but Raphia and Paneum. And Daniel 11.11 11 is about Raphia. So it's related to that. Now, we also have... Um, uh, looking at this verse, Iran noticed that uh, there is um, that this Bible verse, this verse, um, or not this verse, but the first time mitzvah is mentioned, is going to be Genesis thirty-one forty-nine. So he's going to take uh, these steps, and this may be a little bit obscure, but if we look at the word mitzvah, because we want to understand. Uh, significance of this word. Now, in Genesis 31, 49, it's spelled differently. Um, and we're going to look at a little bit more about mitzvah. But here, just that first time that it's mentioned in the Bible, um, it's uh, so 923. And I can't re remember how Aaron explained it. So that's going to be the um, okay. 
I always have trouble with these. So we got the reverse verse is seven. The Bible verse is 923. And the reverse Bible verse is 30180. It doesn't make, okay, okay, that makes sense now. Okay. So in that 923, what's 923? Uh, it relates. It relates to um, the three hundred and forty-third uh, prime. So, so it's it's a prime number, and it's number three hundred and forty-three. Now, um, the three hundred and forty-third prime, which is would be. Uh, I think it's 2309, okay. something like that. Okay. Okay, I see what you're saying. So it's not exactly that number. So the 343rd prime number is um, 2309. So, so you just got this 923 as a symbol. Okay. So that's a little bit obscure. Um, and then we have a reverse Bible verse. So it has uh, 30180. So that gives us 318. And 318 is a significant number, which relates to um, uh, 1533, um, 21 hours and 1533 minutes. Now, uh, the point is that this, these studies are going to be related to, these symbols are going to be related to this 318, to what Jeff is presenting in connection with this Levitical chiasm. So on, on March 28th, he's going to present um, 1533 days, and he's going to go through 1533 in a number of ways. And uh, then on March 31st, he's going to present the Le Levitical chiasm. So this is still kind of part of the same study. Um, so, so anyway, that's, that's some things we get from mitzvah. Now, mitzvah, of course, is the watchtower, right? So this is, uh, the watchtower. And we look at the publication of the ad in the Tennessee, and that's going to get all of that attention. So it's going to be published, of course, the day before. Um, June 22nd, but we put, uh, so June 21st, but it's really when it becomes international attention is on June 22nd. So, so we put this as this next event. So the first message is addressing, it's going to be empowered with this presentation and this presentation as an empowerment, um, you know, we have presentations as empowerment, but the main point about this is it brings together a bunch of different things. And this primary application of uh, the Levitical chiasm. So this whole, all these things are brought together in this Levitical chiasm. It becomes extremely instrumental in me understanding the 777 chiasm because I use it as a model. So, so this presentation on March 31st, we're gonna place as the empowerment. But, you know, you could say March 28th to 31st, because there's other things as well that are connected to establishing this Levitical chiasm that he puts in place. Um, now, as far as the presentation done on January 11th, 2020, that's going to be a number five uh, presentation by Daniel Fontenot on um approaching doom and the significance there um, is in his presentation is he's talking about this conflict on Mount Carmel about the fire coming down on July 18 2020 and um, in connection with this um, cause I'm not sure exactly what Jeff saw, but Jeff saw something there regarding, uh, Raffi and Panini. Uh, 
that to him was important. Well, something to do with Daniel, the book of Daniel. And I know it's... Um, so to him, it was an understanding of Daniel 11.11 11 that came to him on January 11th, right? So he started to understand this whole Raphael Paneum thing. So, so we can see why the March 28th presentation is important because he's going to address that. But then it's going to be on the March 31st presentation, which I believe is the next presentation, um, that he brings out the Levitical chiasm and he tells us about this January 11th date. <clears throat> so, so there is this presentation, right? Um, and then we have mitzvah, which is a presentation regarding July 18th. Now, in the verse itself, when we look at the verse, um, it is saying that um, in, the, in the latter part of the verse, Jeph Jephthah uttered all his words before the Lord in Mitzpah. Now, I mean, this means he goes before God and utters his words. Now, the question is, what words is he uttering? Now, it seems to be that this is what's being in Judges 11.9. 9, um, Jephthah said unto the elders of Gilead, if ye bring me home again to fight against the children of Ammon, and the Lord deliver them before me, shall I be your head? So this is the question. And then the elders of Gilead said... Unto Jephthah, the Lord be witness between us, if we do not so according to thy words. Um, now, so when it says that uh, he uttered all his words before the Lord, that's just the form of this word debar, where you can see that it's it's going to end in uh, uh, here in the in the form to, that shows that it's uh, his words, right? So a uh, dabaron, right? It's going to have this uh, uh, ending here with but this funny ending. It's going to have uh, a yod and a noon, the, the final noon at the end. Um, it's just the letter noon, N. So dabaron. And um, I think it's how you pronounce it. I'm always bad at pronouncing these things. But the point here is that um, when it says his words, it, it's not always clear in Hebrew who his is referring to, though in this case, it, it's probably referring to Jephthah's words that he said to the elders of Gilead, because there isn't another his, right? There's their words, right? If, if the elders of Gilead's words were being repeated to before the Lord, then it would be their words, but it's his words. And um, so it seems to me that that, uh, that makes sense that it's his words. Now he's repeating them before the Lord, uttering them before the Lord. Now, how can we relate this to the Tennessean publication? If, if this is a message, the message of Jephthah, having to do with uh, time, specifically July 18th, even though this is going to be, the whole line is about December 6th. But this first message relates to July 18th. How can him uttering his words before the Lord in Mitzvah, the watchtower, how can that... Uh, relate to the publication in the Tennessean because it doesn't seem like we're uttering these words before uh, the Lord by publishing them in the Tennessean or are we, or what's the, the correlation there? Understand the question, but there has to be 
some way in which we can say we can say mitzvah is this this watchtower, um, and that there's this uttering of these words, and so we're going to say that this is placing this ad in the Tennessee and and it being presented to some degree, it's connected with that. Is there any way that we can we can understand that? Because if we look at the next verses, and Jephthah sent messengers unto the king of the children of Ammon, saying, what hast thou to do with me that thou art come against me to fight in my land? This is going to be um, this message of Jephthah being sent to uh, the king of the children of Ammon, right? So there's going to be this discussion regarding about, about this conflict. Why are you having this conflict with us? And we had taken this as um, when, when we put this on the line previously, um, we had taken a June 22nd, 2020, and we had marked that as addressing this discussion. So we, we took the publication of this and addressed it from Judges 11, 12 to 27, right? So this is this is going to be uh, a different a different verses that we're using here. So it, it becomes a little bit confusing how we're going to sort through this. Are we going to say that, um, you know, Judges 11.11 11 is both the empowerment and the arrival, but we're using completely different events than we were before. So just to show you that. <clears throat> so here we have Judges 11.11. 11. That's January 11th in this case. Right. And then March 31st is Judges 11.11. 11. That's how we had it, right? So we had uh, January 11th, March 31st, but now we're saying, well, now we're going to move March 31st over here, which means we have to move June 22nd over here. So this is quite a different relationship between June 22nd and March 31st in this line than it is in this line. So if we, we see that problem, that we have with these lines. So it's, how, how do we address this problem? Because we haven't addressed it. In some ways, we can say that the judges 12 to 27 actually fits better with June 22nd. Um, but in trying to adjust this line so that November 9th, 2019 is the start of this line. It doesn't, doesn't really fit, right? So, so that's how we've tried to deal with it. But I mean, we could say that June 22nd is just that where we get this world's attention and then judges 12 to 27, this negotiation sort of discussion that goes on with uh, King of Ammon. The King of the children of Ammon. Um, regarding the past, um, what we would, we, we'd have to place some date there. And so we had these dates, we had more, you know, we had uh, June 22nd and October 22nd. We've moved these over now. And now we have, well, what dates do we place here? So you know, we have June 22nd, you know, after June 22nd, 2020. If that's an arrival of the message, the publication there. And December 6th, 2020, we have is the third angel arriving. I mean, 
we might also just move this over and say that this is the empowerment here, right? So we would take this and move it over. Because here's what we had, and this might work. If we, in, in, as we understand this message. So, so if we move that there, this is gonna be some other date. So unspecified at this point, right? And this date would be that October 30th date. And that's going to be, um, whatever it is, committee, tribunal, whatever you want to call it, conference, uh, where they're going to uh, set up this, this committee to address December, or not address, address July 18th, and on December 6th, 2020, they're going to have their declaration, right? So, so we've moved these all over. Now, this does sort of make sense um, if we look at those verses 12 to 27. So let's just read through those verses. And does this address these this symbols here, address that message? So when we get to chapter 11, verse 12, and Jephthah sent messengers unto the king of the children of Ammon, saying, what hast thou to do with me? that thou art come against me to fight in my land. Now, now Jephthah is a message. Yeah, and Angela is noting that there's a connection between the elders consulting with Jephthah and the elders consulting with Ezekiel. Right, so let's kind of think about that. So this is earlier in verse 11, we have this consultation. And, and then we're going to have in verse 12 and 13, we're going to now have this negotiation with the king, of Am, the king of the children of Ammon. So the king of the children of Ammon would have to be a message. And this message is negotiating with the message of Jephthah. And if we look at the message of Jephthah as being this message about the chronology of July 18th, and what we've said about Jephthah is it contains all kinds of symbols, chronological symbols, it's basically the epitome of, of symbols, of dates, and everything that we're doing. And um, so this uh, king of the children of Ammon, who's come against them, is something within the movement, this internal conflict within, this, within the movement. And that's going to end with the declaration of December 6, 2020. And what it's going to be addressing is the past, right? Um, so Jephthah says, Israel took not away the land of Moab, nor the land of the children of Ammon. But when Israel came up from Egypt and walked through the wilderness unto the Red Sea and came to Kadesh, then Israel sent messengers unto king, the king of Edom, saying, Let me, I pray thee, pass through thy land. But the king of Edom would not hearken thereto. And in like manner, they sent unto the king of Moab, but he would not consent, and Israel abode in Kadesh. Then they went along through the wilderness, wilderness and compassed the land of Edom and the land of Moab, and came by the east side of the land of Moab, and pitched on the other side of Arnon, but came not within the border of Moab, for Arnon was the border of Moab. And Israel sent messengers unto Sihon, king of the Amorites, the king of Heshbon, and Israel said unto him, Let us pass, we pray we pray thee through thy land into, into my place. But Sion trusted not Israel to pass through his coast, but Sion gathered all his people together and pitched at in Jahaz, Jahaz and fought against Israel. And the Lord God of Israel delivered Sihon and all his people into the hand of Israel, and they smote them. So Israel possessed all the land of the Amorites and the inhabitants of that country. And they possessed all the coasts, coasts of the Amorites from Arnon even unto Jabbok and from the wilderness even unto Jordan. So now the Lord God of Israel has dispossessed the Amorites from before his people. And shouldst thou possess it? Wilt thou, not thou possess that which Chemosh thy God giveth thee to possess? 
So whomsoever the Lord our God shall drive out from before us, then we will possess. And now art thou anything better than Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he ever strive against Israel, or did he ever fight against them? While well, Israel dwelt in Heshbon and her towns, and Aurora and her towns, and in all the cities that be along the coasts of Arnon, 300 years, why therefore did ye not recover them within that time? Therefore I have not sinned against thee, but thou doest me wrong to war against me. The Lord, the judge be judge this day between the children of Israel and the children of Ammon. Howbeit the king of the children of Ammon hearken not unto the words of Jephthah, which he sent him. So the argument here is that we didn't actually take these lines from you. We took them from the, um, the Amorites, right? And you're saying it's your land, but it wasn't your land when we took it. Um, so Angela is saying that um, the mention of correct history and old grievances that were never addressed properly and rectified in Judges 11, verse 12 to 28, right? So if we're looking at this, the discussion that's going to happen in this period of time, uh, what Angela is trying to say in this movement, we actually have old grievances that are never resolved. That is, a lot of the, what is end, ends up happening here has to do with personal hurt or slights or imagined hurts or slights uh, that had been occurring in this movement that are never addressed. Um, and of course, that makes no sense to me, right? The things that happened in the movement, there's all the all these things. We're not going to rehearse them all. But when it came to uh, rumors and gossip that happened in this movement, many times I was the subject of accusations, usually having to do with, you know, some kind of deception going on, um, so, some sort of hidden agenda, some kind of duplicity, things like that, which in reality did not exist. But instead of ever addressing them, even when we were at the School of the Prophets in 2018, we wanted to address, because we knew there was something going on, we didn't know what, we just knew that people were treating us Differently. differently than they had been. And, and so we didn't know why. And so we wanted to ask about it. What's going on? You know, what is it that we've done? What is it that we need to correct? Um, uh, but they didn't want to discuss that. Right. So when things unfolded dealing with uh, the, the Thanksgiving prediction in quotation marks, um, and all the things that happened and we ended up, you know, basically being kicked out of the school of the prophets. Just none of it made sense to us. People were reacting to what they imagined. And, and so this would be, uh, you know, trying to correct the history. And so then when we're dealing with this, this, this history after July 18th, all of these old grievances are going to be uh, part of why this is rejected, right? And so things are not in the open. They're not clear, and explained clearly. And, and the question is, well, you had 300 years to rectify this problem. And what you're doing right now is not the right way to do it. You understand the parallel. Because that's when you get the December 6, 2020 declaration, it's not just an intellectual exercise of why we don't agree with this. It's actually very personal. That is, from their perspective, they're looking at personal hurt, personal grievances that lead them to draw these conclusions. That is, this is not just an objective look at July 18th. People have territories they have areas and things they're trying to protect 
whatever they are, you know, um, instead of just trying to address, you know, the ideas, right? And, and this is, I think, a good parallel to that, to that period of time after July 18th. Now, if we're going to take that, this grievances that are being discussed, um, it makes sense to apply them to October 30th, 2020, because that's just going to be this committee that is set up to examine why what went wrong with July 18, 2020. So we're just going to say, okay, I think that's how you spell committee. I know you're supposed to double a lot of the letters. T -T -E -E. Yeah, M M I T T E E. Yeah, that's right. M M I T T E E. Yeah, it's like you're stuttering, but you're not. Yeah, don't double the I though. No. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so we have this committee that's set up, and I know that Dwight is involved in this. Um, and uh, so now Dwight, you're there. Um, so what would you think of the significance of this committee regarding old grievances? So when you go there for this uh, committee, would you say that old grievances are have not been resolved? They never were. Yeah. So, and that's going to be partly why this committee is acting in the way that it is. The, the point that I was told when I was picked up at the airport, the conversation that was had all the way back to the compound was this was going to be looking at the failure of July 18th the failure of the Thanksgiving prediction or, you know, however you want to say it. And it was strictly there to pin blame. Right. So it was a posturing. Definitely. No, they, they had a personal agenda before this thing ever started. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, and that goes all the way back to who knows when, right? It, it goes back because there were those connected with FFA that wanted nothing to have to do with chronology. Right. Yeah. And so it's not about me necessarily personally, but it ends up becoming a personal attack just because of not wanting to deal with some truth. No, they saw you directly. Okay. As the reason that this did not work. They felt that you were the instigator of July 18th and that you were the cause as I would have to say Bronwyn was considering of the failure of the FFA ministry. Yeah. So even though Jeff is the one who promoted the July 18, 2020 prediction. The deal, the, the understanding, the thought process was that you were at fault, that mm -hmm. you had led Jeff astray. Yeah. Even though, even though and let's, Let's look at this very, very completely. Mm -hmm. Whether you're dealing with Mark Bruce, who was brought into this by Emiliano. Yeah. Whether you're dealing with Parminder and Tess. Whether you're dealing with the, with so many others. Elder Jeff was very clear. He had a problem because he would put his trust in people that many times did not deserve that trust. And he was referring to Parmender. He was referring to Tess. He was referring to Mark Bruce. He was referring to Emiliano. Mm -hmm. So you were the scapegoat. <clears throat> yeah, well, I understand that. You know, the thing that's kind of weird is that, you know, I was never 
fully accepted into the movement in the way that any of those people were. I never had any position or other than teaching some classes. I had any positions of responsibility. So, so in this case, um, everything was in their control, whether they wanted to accept something or not. Okay, so let's let's look at a biblical parallel. Mm -hmm. After the crucifixion, and let's say for the next five years, was Paul accepted directly by the disciples? No. Okay. <clears throat> was Paul right in what he had to say? Mm-hmm. And, and the thing is, either something is true or it's not. Amen. So when, you know, and my belief is that God can take care of his truth. Um, unlike other people who were opposed, I never acted in the same manner. It is, I never tried to push uh, anything. So even with July 18th, that was Jeff who resurrected it. Right. So all I did is present chronology. Right. Jeff saw something in it. I never had the power or the authority to push anything. It was never ever given to me. Is all I'm trying to say. And yet there, I, and I tried to give warnings that it possibly could fail, but those are ignored. Right. So. Um, and, and after July 18th, when I point this out uh, to Bronwyn, she was quite upset about it. You know, she really didn't believe me, right? Even though I could send her the email that I sent Jeff um, and, and, you know, tell her, you know, here's my presentations. You can see my presentations. Um, so I know she was upset about it, right? The, the, the idea that I had warned them that it could fail. But all during that time, they're not, I'm not presenting at the School of the Prophets. So, I mean, and even when I was there on November 9th, I mean, they'd just given me the superintendent remarks, right? It was at uh, Toby's suggestion that I also present in the afternoon after he heard the first presentation. He says, well, this needs another presentation on the 273. So, so, you know, the movement wasn't relying on me. It was Jeff. Jeff is, Jeff is the leader. He's the one who's making that decision. And, and it didn't make sense to, from my perspective, to attack me. And, and that's what I'm trying to say here with this, this situation. If we're looking at these as messages, the message of Jeff, though, is this message of chronology relating to July 18th that then is going to be examined. And now we don't have July 18th in this line, right? And we could have, we could have just moved these over and put July 18th in there. Um, but I don't see that it fits anywhere in this line of Jephthah. Uh, what I see is this October 30th, this committee, you know, as Angela points out, these are the unresolved issues, a correction of history. And I, and I give them that opportunity to have a corrected history, but they're, they're going to reject it. And that's going to be empowered with this declaration. So, so the thing that they're most embarrassed about is that they made a public promise proclamation of this July 18th, right? If this had been something that we just discussed within the movement and they had never made a proclamation of it to embarrass themselves as they would see it, I don't think we would have had as much opposition. We wouldn't have had this problem, right? If we had just been studying something and it was just, just, something we were looking at ourselves within the movement, I don't think it would have been an embarrassment, right? And, and they didn't want to be embarrassed. Like, I don't quite understand that, but 
you know, even when it came to the Thanksgiving Day pred prediction, they didn't want to record it. They didn't want to, to see it even, right? They didn't want to see what we had noticed. And then when we did record it on November 9th, and, and I think we have to somehow go back to this November 9th date, because um, it's not going to really be November 9th. It's going to be November 10th that I actually present it, but it's going to be that weekend. Um, they All they want to talk about is this Thanksgiving Day prediction, right? They're not interested in talking about July 18. They're just trying to nail down that I had made this prediction that failed. And it was right. really, uh, Larry Hine who was, you know, giving all this misinformation regarding this. Now, Stephen and Adilio were there. Um, and, and they can testify that Jeff accepted the whole logic of what I had done. He just differ differed with what event was fulfilled. But that was sort of my point, because the whole reason I believe that that Thanksgiving Day pr prediction was given is to test whether we could predict events or not. And it, and it was pretty clear that we couldn't, even after the fact, we could disagree about what those events were. And that should have been a warning to us in the movement that, you know, we can put dates on a line, but to say with a certainty that some event would happen, um, there's no way that we could do that. And, and Jeff, through that history, you know, is going to talk about Jonah. Well, Jonah made a prediction that it didn't occur, right? We're also going right. to have, um, uh, you know, Abraham offering up Isaac as another example of what the July 18 prediction was about. Well, you know, it's a test of our faith in trusting in God because of our past failures. But he's not going to offer up Isaac. God has a substitute provided. Right, this ram in the thicket, which points to Christ. And, and so if we look back at all of these different parable, parallels and we look at October 22, all of these things show that, that God was leading, but we had to go through this experience. Abraham had to go through an experience. Jonah did. The Millerites. And, and that, to me, should have been a satisfactory explanation for a Seventh-day Adventist. And it should have corrected us from making fu future predictions. But it shouldn't have stopped us from analyzing our history line upon line and recognizing the chronological symbols. Because that's all we're doing. We're watching and waiting. We're looking at where we are. We're getting light for our feet. But the committee that set up with their declaration on December 6th, has no interest in that, right? All they're interested in is, is territory that they feel uh, was unjustly taken from them, and which wasn't taken from them by the Israelites, right? Would have been taken from them by the children of Ammon, or I mean the Amorites, because these are the children of Ammon. Um, right, so other people had taken this territory. Now, the Israelites now possessed it, but they didn't take it from them. Right, that's how we understand it. Now, we also have in this story the 300 years. Right, so... The, so that 300 years becomes this symbol. It's the number of the 300. So, so if we're going to take the 300 years, it's a symbol of the story of Gideon, right? Okay. So, so how does that relate as Jephthah's, why, why in he, him relating to this past history in the 300 years, what is he stating?
What is Jephthah stating? Yeah, what is he stating when he refers to this 300 years? What If we take that into our time and we try to address this way mark, October 30th, I mean, one of the things you can see is what's 10 times 30? 300. Okay. So, so we have the 300 that's referred to. Okay. So that's the symbol there in this story. And that's October 30th, 30th day of the 10th month. 10 times 30 is 300. Okay. And so this is referred to, this symbol, the 300 years in which they had to resolve this issue, but they hadn't. And, and they have a mistaken account of history. So Jephthah's uh, addressing that. Okay, so what else could we see there? Well, if we're gonna if we're gonna be applying this with the three hundred, like you've said, there's Gideon, but there's also the three hundred that gave the warning with the Millerites prior to eighteen forty four. Okay. Yep. So we have Millerites there. We have the three hundred there. I mean, the 300 shows up as different types of symbols, but. Um, but the, the situation like with this with Gideon, those 300 boiled down to a, a point of character, how they were going to approach the, the refreshing that was being given them. Mm-hmm. So the symbolism there is huge. Yeah. You know, and, and this isn't like about justifying my character or anything like that, because I've made a lot of mistakes as a person. Um, but when it comes to this particular point, July 18, I have entrusted it to God's care. That's That's just the reality. So when I was told to stop presenting it, I did. Doesn't mean I stopped studying it, because me and Adilio and Stephen were still studying it in that period of time. And Adilio was urging me, because on March 27th, 2019, he's going to tell me, you know, you can't, you know, back off on July 18th. You've got to present it. It's truth. And I said, well, you know, it's not up to me. Because I'm not the leader of, of this movement. Right. I'm a nobody in the movement. If the movement decides to pick up July 18th, that's the movement doing it. See, what you were doing in that conversation with Odilio is very much similar to the situation with Gideon. Yeah, well, because this is God's. It's, well, not, about, it's not about any of us personally. But how did, how did Gideon ap approach this? Well, he left it in God's hands. If you're talking about the fleece and things like that. I am I am the least in all of Manasseh, the least of the least. Mm -hmm. None of us at any point sought or attempted to become leaders of the FFA ministry. Correct. Right. Now, people now, in, in FFA would think, well, you know, you're presenting, you must have ambitions like we do. Okay. Now, my first time down to FFA, I was asked to give a presentation. That presentation right now was taken down off the internet because of the December 6th decision. Yeah. I really didn't care that it was taken down. I still have my notes. Yeah. It's a, for me, it was a so what. I was asked to give a presentation. I didn't feel worthy, but I did. Yeah. I sought nothing within FFA. Now, in a similar situation, you sought nothing within FFA because, I mean, this 
it's not in your character to seek to become a focal point of a, what was at that time an international ministry. Well, even as a musician, I always hated, you know, as a musician, I did lots of albums, lots of concerts. I performed before 5,000 people, but I never liked it. I mean, I liked recording and writing songs, and I liked blessing people one-on-one, -on -one, going door-to-door -door with scripture songs. But the idea of being, you know, the center of attention, and, you know, that's, that wasn't why I was a musician, right? The only thing a musician wants is they want people to hear their music. They want people to be blessed by it. You want to be useful, right? But, and, and that's the same with, with, the truth, because in the end, um, you know, what what all that really matters is the truth. Now, God obviously has blessings for us. And those blessings are because of the truth, not because of some position. Like Heidi and I have been reading through five testimonies. And there's so many times that she's writing counsels to people who are seeking position, but not willing to do the work. And that, you know, if they just did the work that God asked them to do, that's where they would receive their blessing. But people want to have recognition from man. And that doesn't make any sense. Because who cares if somebody thinks you're wonderful? Like, what does their opinion matter? And it's the same thing if somebody thinks you're an idiot. It doesn't matter. However, right? God, too, is not a respecter of persons. So we should be following his example. Well, but the thing about God is I like God's approbation much better than man's well, that's true. because God actually can evaluate us correctly. Exactly. Man may have opinions about us that don't bear any resemblance to reality, either in the positive or the negative. But the whole point of this committee is not, it's not <laughs> interested in finding the truth. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's just trying to address blame, right, as you said. And so when we get the December 6, 2020 declaration, I mean, the manner in which, you know, you just shut down things, but there's no communication, there's no back and forth, um, other than accusations. I mean, if people were to look at the emails, the scant emails that I received from people, I mean, it's just simply an attack. It's not, not somebody trying to find out the truth, right? They're not going to allow you to present anything that's going to persuade them in any other way than what they've already decided. Right? And they're going to... They're not going to present sound arguments. So, so that to me is just, you know, what this is all about, this history. It's from June 22nd. We get international attention. And now when we have this failure, the committee is then just trying to save face and find a scapegoat so that they can feel that they're not responsible. But they're responsible for, you know, it takes two to lie, one to lie and one to listen. So if you believed a lie, if you really believe that you believed a lie, you need to take blame for that. If they really thought that they had done something wrong, then they, they should have taken blame for it. But they don't want to take any blame for anything that has happened, Right? even though they're the ones who, who are promoting July 18th. They never did want to take any kind of blame. No. no. You know, and the reality is we need to take responsibility for our actions and our choices. Right? And if, if we were deceived, if we really believe that we were deceived, then they need to make an apology. But they want other people to make an apology for them. It doesn't make any sense to me. 
that that's that's the reality of what happened. So now this June twenty second date, of course, it's tied up. It's a date that Jeff has given, and it's tied up in all of these symbols, right? One hundred sixty five thousand dollars, Ezra seven nine the center of the 777 chiasm, which is the one that says that we're in a line of failed predictions, and then the publication in the Tennessee. But these, this is what the committee is trying to distance itself from, all of this that has gone before. And so this second angel here is then a rejection of a message. And and so we're going to say the formalization is this committee, but it's 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 not again, it's not there. They're not. That's not the message that arrives on June 22nd. That's being formalized by the committee per se. It's their rejection of June 22nd that's being formalized. Right. So this message, in a sense, is uh we're saying it's a reform message, but it's a reform message that's being rejected by these waymarks, which which I think is acceptable, right? Because the first message is going to be about Theodore, this. Yeah. Theodore, you need to change the two where you have the two slash two, 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 six. Uh, so there's a typo there. Where you have the list of Six twenty-two. Yeah, and also I'm seeing a parallel. Like I wasn't at these meetings, but between October thirtieth, twenty twenty, and what happened February sixteenth, twenty two, when you were banned, when the, your link was banned, as mm -hmm. I put in the chat. Okay. So. Okay. So, um, where's the slash? Did I have to change or the two? Yeah, you have 622, 622, but on top you have 222 and the 165,000 on the lower left of the of the diagram there. 226 and 622. And then under you have 222. Oh, well, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I see what you're saying now. Yeah. yeah. Pardon me. So 622.11. There you go. Thank you. Okay. Now you were saying about, um, what were you saying just before that? Because I missed it. About the December 6th. Well, yeah, you're mentioning a meeting on October 30th, 20th. And I, if, uh, just as the, the past was put into this bias, biased view, right? They didn't want to look at what had yeah. actually occurred. Uh, it seemed that, that there was a meeting to decide to ban your link from the 3 AMF, uh, you know, when they were giving us their notes, mm -hmm. telling us, you know, to, to come, come to these meetings. All of a sudden you were dropped and I mean, you weren't even consulted about this. Nothing has been fixed. The, the rift hasn't been repaired. Mm -hmm. So there's a major problem there. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, all people would need to do is look at even the correspondence that I have with Bronwyn or Larry Hine or Larry Lesher. And it would be really, really obvious to anybody reading it that this is not really about what the truth is. Let's get at the truth of something. It's just simply an attack, which really has no part in understanding the truth. And, and we can see that with December 6, 2020, just the lack of communication. Um, and of course, we know the events on the 4th and the 5th uh, that precede December 6. So there's a paper called Three Days where we address that. So, um, so when they get to December 6, we're saying that this is the empowerment of this message. But it's kind of odd that it's not like it's actually a rejection of a message that is the empowerment. And we're saying that that's fine because what's being empowered is the message by this rejection, right? So the rejection of this message empowers it. The rejection of this message formalizes it. 
This is Jephthah sharing, putting all of his words before God. And, and what we see is a rejection of that message, not by God, but by, by man, right? And so he puts all these words before God, and then he presents the correct history so that we can understand June 22nd, that we're not going to be embarrassed by it. But these, these messages here rejected. So the October 30th, 2020 committee and, you know, so all of these symbols here, right? The 622, the 300, the 126, um, you know, 1111, January 11th, uh, everything here just fits together. Um, 130 days from, from where? Uh, from June 22nd yeah. to October 30th. Oh, so to October 30th. There's going to be, yeah, 130 days here. Yeah. And, and you can see there with the, the one and the three and the zero, right? October 30th and 130 days. Okay. So it gives us the 300 as well. And, uh, and then another, what, 30, 37 days, something like that to December 6th. <clears throat> now we know from June 22nd, 2020, uh, there's going to be that period of time uh, to December 25th, 2020 as well, so 187 days. But anyway, um, we, we need then an arrival of a third message because we can do this. We've moved these things over, right, this way, but we don't have uh, where the third angel arrives. Now, we have a, at the top here, we still have that six years there because this is going to be the six years of, of, of Jephthah. And, but now it's not six years anymore, right? So because we started on 2014. That's actually why we had 2014 in the first place. It was because of these six years. But we're going to say that, that it's not six years now, like literally. But it's still a symbol because this is the message of Jephthah goes for six years so it comes to an end if we're going to say you know that it comes to an end it has to fit in here somewhere um so we'd have to figure out when that comes to an end <clears throat> so that's that's where we have you know these um, and and we, we mark that six years because that's going to be 12 or 7. Now we have Judges 12, 7 over here. And we have Judges 12, verse 1 to 6, which we had as, as the third angel's message arriving. Now, but we had uh, the event that we had for Judges 29 to 40 was, and, and, I, and I think this fits better, but it's going to be Jephthah's tragic vow. Right. So if we look at these verses here, uh, we're now going to have Jephthah's tragic vow as being December 6th. And that's going to be 1129 to verse 40 that we have this tragic vow. And so how do we relate that to December 6th? That's going to be the next problem. Do we split up that those verses and move? Uh, 1129 over to something or other and what what is because we had a, a big problem with Jephthah's tragic vow um, trying to to place it because of the situation that there's going to be this uh, he's going to make a vow to God that if he uh, continues like if he's victorious over the children of Ammon um, then he's going to give an offering 
of whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Ammon. This book will be dedicated to the Lord and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So whether this is actually literally what he does with his daughter or whether it's that she's just dedicated to God because it's a person and he's not supposed to murder her. I mean, that's, that's a, another discussion. Um, but we have Jephthah's tragic vow and how do we relate this then if we're going to put that as December 6th, how do we relate that? And, and do we take the whole thing and move it over there or do we do something else? Okay. Before we, we make that kind of a, a point. Yeah. Did Jephthah understand the law as presented by God as well as Abraham did. Yep. So when Abraham is told to sacrifice Isaac, yeah, he knows full well that human sacrifice is not asked of God. Mm -hmm. Yet he goes forward because he believes that this is what's being asked of him. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, so I, I don't know if we came to a solid conclusion on that, but. Well, the point, the point being here is Jephthah several hundred years after Abraham. Mm -hmm. Now he's not taking his daughter to Mount Moriah to be sacrificed. He's mm -hmm. coming home and his daughter is the, first being to come from the doors of his house to greet him mm -hmm. he is living around the nations that believe in human sacrifice now he is faced with a promise a tragic promise that he must now sacrifice his daughter mm -hmm. That's not what God was asking for. No. And that was not what Jephthah had intended. No. So in this situation, the, the big picture is that while you were warning everyone that July 18th could be on a line of failed predictions mm -hmm. no one else wanted to listen because they wanted the type of glory that would go with a ministry slash prophet that would give a warning that would be fulfilled in such a dramatic manner yeah so, but if we take this, so I understand what you're saying. So if we take this as Jephthah's tragic vow, this is the message of Jephthah that is being characterized here, right? Correct. And now that is, that is July 18th, in a sense, is a misplaced vow. Correct. Okay. Um. So if we're going to place it at December 6, 2020, um, it's then going to be sacrificed, you know, at least symbolically, right? All right. So, so Jetha has this message. On June 22nd, he presents it before the Lord, right? There is this rejection of this message, right? So he's going to... It's going to the October 30th committee. He's going to that that message of Jephthah is going to be the topic of conversation. And then with December 6th, how do we take this this vow here? Um, because I guess the vow comes earlier. Maybe that's what we could say. Right. I mean, we don't know when he made the vow particularly whether he made this vow before or after exactly what the timing of it is. But what is 
going to happen is there is this vow. So however this vow is placed, because they don't always write things in chronological order. So it's going to have this battle. So it could be just retroactively going back to what he says to God. You know, it says, then the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. and He passed over Gilead and Manasseh and passed over Mitzpah of Gilead. And from Mitzpah of Gilead, he passed over unto the children of Ammon. Then it says he vowed a vow. So this is before the battle, whenever this battle is in symbolically in this line. Uh, but he makes this vow. And this vow is going to end up in his daughter coming after he's victorious, being the first one that comes to greet him. And it's his only child, right? So there's symbols in that. Um, so beside her, she does, he doesn't have any other daughters or sons. And um, so the message of Jephthah here is brought very low. Right? I mean, if we're going to say it that way. this. Um, so does Elder Jeff typify Jephthah? Well, no, it's the message. I don't... I'm, and it's the message of Jeff, too, because one of the things Jeff points out is that the July 18, 2020 prediction, in that prediction, everything that he had ever studied comes together, right? Right. Which is why it was so powerful for him, right? Why he accepted it back in 2018 and why once Parminder was out of the way, he reexamined it, knowing that this is the message because he had seen that before. Right. It was it was difficult. I remember when he came back from Brazil in November of uh, 2018. I mean, he couldn't look me in the eye, but he also looked very discouraged. Right. He was very discouraged by his time in Brazil where he was told you can't talk about July 18, 2020. Right. That's not our message because he saw it. He saw how Samuel Snow's letters fit and how everything fit, everything that he had ever studied. And the more he studied it, the more convinced he became. So when they with the December 6, 2020 declaration. You know, we have the symbol of the twenty five twenty, the one twenty six shekels, all of these things. It's it's going to it's based it's a rejection of Jeff's message. I mean, it's so clear that that's what it is. Now, they're not going to say that we're rejecting everything that Jeff did, but they are. And they and they try to narrow it down to, you know, the symbolic use of dates in particular uh, ways. But you can't just pick and choose. You can't just say, well, we can use symbolic use of dates, but in this case, uh, we can't just because the event didn't happen. You know, we're going to reject the 264 and July 27th and 391 and all these different things. Just because the event didn't happen. So, so it's a rejection of, of Jeff's message because this isn't really about, you know, Jeff as a person or me as a person or any person. It's, it's about the message of Jephthah. And the message of Jephthah is really pulling together all of these things in FFA, all of this chronology. And you can see that by the January 11th the date there, the end of the Levitical chiasm. How many things come together in that, which he's going to present on March 31st. And then, you know, when Jeff then publishes this ad in the Tennessean, all of these things have gone before, right? We've this is going to be, you know, three months, you know, after March 31st. So you got, you know, April, May, and then part of June until this is published. And then, you know, we have July 18th. It's not on this line, but we have the failure of this prediction. And so the committee is addressing that. They're addressing what was published on June 22nd. You know, and even this whole thing of, you know, to sort of finish off today, we should be able to get this done tomorrow. But just, 
even dealing with the publication, the, like the, the web page. So I was asked to do this back in January of 2020. And I did all this work, hours and hours of editing other people's papers, getting them all lined up so they're on the same format and that we could put this onto a web page. And without, even though they had told me to do this, without even talking to me or notifying me in any way that they even made a decision they just ended up doing it their own way right no discussion no communication none of my work was used right and the only thing that i got published and it was just temporarily was uh the 777 chiasm paper showing that we're on a line of failed predictions it was up for a couple of days and then they took it down again, without even notifying me or talking to me about it in any way. So, so this is the type of way in which the message had been dealt with. You know, from November 9th, 2019, I made no presentations ever at the School of the Prophets or anything since that date. The last presentation I did for them was on November 9th. So not in this period of time, they're not asking me to do any presentations on their, their meetings, you know, which other people do it by Zoom, right? So they could have had me present, but they don't. So, and it's not because of me personally that it matters, right? It's just the very fact that they're not wanting to hear this message is clear all through this whole history from November 9th to December 6th. So um, the only thing that we're going to do tomorrow then is we're going to look at the rest of this line because I think this is all very solid. Um, well, um, okay, so I can get, we can guess that Jeff is discouraged because of what FFA has decided. He's now silent like the gap gap after Malachi. I, I don't think that that's why Jeff is silent. I, he was quite clear that he was going to be silent after July 18th. Uh, before that, so before that, he made clear, no matter what happens on July 18th, that's the end of FFA. That's the end of this organization, right? So Jeff had already decided beforehand and, and his belief had to do with the parallel with Millerite history. Because even through this whole time, Jeff felt that he had made so many mistakes, even though he took up the July 18, 2020 proclamation, he didn't feel that he could be a part of that work after. All right, so he understood the line. I understood that line as well. So when Jeff had said that before July 18th, I, I accepted that that was the logical course. I didn't like it because it'd be nice to have Jeff here studying these things with us. Um, but it was actually what had to happen, and Jeff knew that. And, and for Jeff, this wasn't about any sort of discouragement about July 18th. I don't believe And, and I believe that he still believes in the message. He just doesn't believe that he can have a part in it. So, <clears throat> so when we look at this third angel arriving, which we're, what we're going to look at uh, tomorrow, um, you know, I would think that we have to put December twenty fifth, twenty twenty there. So I want you to think about that. why we would put that date. Um, I don't know why I have that word. But one of the things we know is that this is um, connected to June 22nd by 187 days. And then we can see how that, that is the arrival of a new message.
So I want, I want people to think about that. We'll come back to it, um, examine the reasons, and uh, hopefully we can address the rest of, of Jephthah because we do have chapter 12 and we're going to have to figure out how that works. So that's where we're going to be moving. Okay. Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay. Let's pray. Dear father in heaven, thank you for your blessings, for all the th things that you have taught us. And for each person, we pray that you can be with them and your angels watch over them. And um, we thank you for all things in Jesus name. We pray. Amen.